Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar for the 2021 Offshore Greenhouse Gas Storage Acreage Release. I begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we all meet and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here with us today. By way of introductions, my name is Cara Peach and I'm the manager of the Offshore Exploration section within the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. My role at the department is to provide policy advice on offshore resource matters, including offshore petroleum exploration, offshore greenhouse gas storage and offshore minerals, and that includes the management of all acreage release processes. Thank you all for tuning in. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you all today to talk about the first greenhouse gas acreage release since 2014. Over recent times, we have seen a monumental shift in industry focus, coupled with the Australian government's commitment to achieving net zero emissions by 2050. Today's release of acreage will provide some real-time practical opportunities for e exploration to occur for carbon capture and storage sites within the offshore area. So today we will hear presentations from Ms. Christina Anastasi, Dr. Tom Bernicke and Dr. Andrew Feitz from Geoscience Australia, as well as hearing from Dr. Monica Campy from the National Offshore Petroleum Titles Administrator, or as they are more broadly known as NOPTA. At the conclusion of the presentations today, there will be an interactive question and answer session whereby anybody can submit questions either via the private chat function or via email to ghgacreage at industry.gov.au. To begin today's proceedings, I would like to welcome the Minister for Resources and Water, the Honourable Keith Pitt. Minister Pitt will formally announce the opening of the 2021 Offshore Greenhouse Gas Storage Acreage Release. Well, hello all. Welcome to Australia's 2021 Offshore Greenhouse Gas Storage Acreage Release. It's very pleasing to see that this release has attracted both domestic and international interest. Thanks to Geoscience Australia for hosting this webinar and to all those who will be contributing today. This is Australia's first greenhouse gas acreage release since 2014 and the third we have held. The Australian Government is focused on the use of technology, not taxes, or impositions on business to meet emission reductions commitments. Carbon capture use and storage, or CCUS, is one of the priority technologies that we are developing. We are investing more than $300 million over the next 10 years in CCUS projects and hubs. This includes the $50 million CCUS Development Fund, launched in March 21, and the $250 million CCUS Hub and Technologies Program, launched in September 2021. These investments build on the $790 million invested in CCUS-related initiatives since 2008. And the 2021 Offshore Greenhouse Gas Storage Acreage Release will support global emissions reductions while helping to ensure Australia's oil and gas industry remains strong. The oil and gas industry provides essential support to regional Australia and is vital to the nation. It also underpins growth and prosperity for many of our most important trading partners. Australian commodities like LNG support much of global manufacturing and energy supply. We are also well placed to be a world leader in greenhouse gas storage. And today I am pleased to announce the opening of bidding on five areas for the 2021 acreage release. Two areas are located in the Petrel sub-basin adjacent to Darwin. One is located in the Browse Basin offshore of Western Australia and a further two are located in the North Carnarvon Basin, offshore of WA. All of these locations represent outstanding opportunities for industry to explore for suitable permanent offshore CO2 storage sites. And as you'll hear from Geoscience Australia shortly, a number of these areas have already been assessed for their high potential to represent areas of significant storage. The government continues to provide ready access to thousands of terabytes of open file data by the online National Offshore Petroleum Information Management System. And Geoscience Australia is providing access to a wealth of pre-competitive data sets and petroleum geological information in support of the release of offshore acreage. Developing Northern Australia is another government priority and the location of release areas will see significant investment in regional Western Australia and of course the North. 
The proximity to gas fields and existing infrastructure of some of these areas provide opportunities for industry partnership and collaboration, further industrial development and the creation of jobs. Secure energy can be produced while lowering emissions and reducing the initial cost of development. It is important to note that title holders are required to consult with relevant stakeholders, including the fishing industry, in the course of preparing to undertake any on-water activities. Maintaining good relations with the fisheries sector is crucial to ensure that both industries can continue to operate efficiently. Bids can be submitted to the National Offshore Petroleum Titles Administrator from the 4th of March, which is a Friday, 2022, to Thursday the 10th of March, 2022. Finally, I'd like to emphasise that Australia's technology-led approach to emissions reduction is working. We have reduced emissions by more than 20% on 2005 levels, much higher than the OECD average. And the most recent projections show we will cut our emissions by up to 35% by 2030, well above our target of 26 to 28%. I will work to ensure that Australia remains an attractive destination for investment while maintaining our position as a world leader in the resources sector. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time today, Minister Pitt. From my personal perspective, I'm particularly excited to be part of this new journey to see the ongoing development of carbon capture and storage projects in offshore Australia. Australia is ideally placed to be able to offer such opportunities and our next speakers from Geoscience Australia will provide further insights from a geological perspective. Geoscience Australia is the nation's trusted advisor on the geology and geography of this country, applying science and technology to describe and understand the earth for our benefit. Our first speaker from Geoscience Australia is Ms Christina Anastasi, General Manager of Advice, Investment Attraction and Analysis. Today, she will talk about the relevant government initiatives available in relation to low carbon technologies. Christina will be followed by Dr. Andrew Feitz, Director of Low Carbon Geoscience and Advice. As part of Andrew's established career as an environment engineer, he joined the Geoscience Australia team in 2008, where he developed and led a research program to evaluate monitoring techniques for geological storage of carbon dioxide. Andrew will be talking today about carbon capture and storage activities and discussing how it all works in practice, drawing on international examples. Our final speaker from Geoscience Australia will be Dr Tom Bernica, Director of Energy Resources Advice and Promotion. Tom is a sedimentary and petroleum geologist with a long-standing history of providing expert support and advice to government in relation to the government's acreage release processes. Today's Tom's presentation will focus on the five areas offshore Western Australia and Northern Territory which are being released today. So without further ado, I will pass to Christina to commence the presentations for GA. Thank you, Cara, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be the first speaker at today's presentation on the 2021 release of offshore acreage for greenhouse gas storage in Australia. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Christina Anastasi and I am the branch head for the Advice, Investment Attraction and Analysis branch here at Geoscience Australia. Now, before I pass over to my two colleagues, Dr Andrew Feitz and Dr Tom Bernica, I intend to provide you with a brief overview of the Australian Government's policy framework and the work that Geoscience Australia is undertaking in this expanding energy space. You will agree that it is a very exciting time in the energy policy agenda, particularly for both our hydrogen and CCS industries. The Australian Government is committed to investing in the next generation of energy technologies that will deliver lower emissions, lower costs and more jobs. The government's 2017 National Resource Statement, which articulated a vision of Australia having the world's most advanced, innovative and successful resources sector, has been the driving force for many of the energy initiatives and programs that are being implemented today. And while we might be known for our non-renewable energy commodities such as oil and gas, coal and uranium, Australia is also looking to the future and working through a range of initiatives to ensure we, like the rest of the world, 
are transitioning to a lower carbon future, including through opportunities for clean, renewable energy. This is evident by the range of announcements by the government since our National Resource Set Statement, with only some of them being identified on this slide. Over the past few years, we've had the Technology Investment Roadmap and the National Hydrogen Strategy. And just only last month at COP26, the Australian government confirmed its commitment to net zero emissions by 2050 and presented its technology-driven plan, Australia's long-term emissions reductions plan, to achieving this commitment. Hydrogen and CCS are two key technology drivers that the Australian Government is investing in. The others include green steel and soil carbon. The Technology Investment Roadmap underpinning Australia's long-term emissions reduction plan will guide more than 20 billion of government investment in low emissions technology to 2030 across the resources value chain. The importance of the hydrogen and CCS industry to Australia's long-term emissions reduction is also recognised by Geoscience Australia and is a big part of Geoscience Australia's strategy 2028. It is also a focus of the energy component of our Exploring for the Future program. The Exploring for the Future program is led by Geoscience Australia in collaboration with our State and Northern Territory partners. It is an example of the Australian Government backing the resources sector and the Australian economy. In this case, with a $225 million investment over eight years to support the resources sector by providing pre-competitive data about potential mineral, energy and groundwater resources. The program currently has eight major projects. These comprise of three in-depth projects in the potentially resource-rich eastern and western corridors of Australia, three continental scale projects that have national applications, and two program support projects. On this slide, you will see a bit of an overview of the different projects, and this slide is focusing on those that have a key energy component. These include the Australian Resources Framework, the Australia's Future Energy Resources, which I will talk further into the next slide, the Officer Musgrave Project, and the Barclay Isa Georgetown Project. The energy component of the Exploring for the Future program is tasked with evaluating energy resources potential of underexplored basins in Central Australia and the Eastern Corridor regions. This includes determining the prospectivity of these basins for conventional and unconventional energy resources, the carbon storage potential, as well as investigating new oil and CO2 resources that can be unlocked through CO2 enhanced oil recovery, as well as identifying potential hydrogen storage sites in thick salt formations. We are also working to understand the formation and occurrence of natural hydrogen accumulations. Another key component of Australia's Future Energy Resources Project is the Residual Oil Zone and CO2 Enhanced Oil Recovery Scoping Study. This study is looking to identify oil and condensate resources in Australia that can be targeted using CO2 EOR. We will be developing a screening methodology that can assess the potential for EOR applications in Australia. It will also estimate potential recoverable oil and potential CO2 that could be stored in each basin as part of this process. To date, the study has revealed that there are significant residual oil zones that could be present that can add to resources while at the same time store significant CO2. If you're interested in the energy work we are undertaking as part of our Exploring for the Future program, I'd encourage you to visit the website, the, which is listed at the bottom of this slide at www.ga.gov.au backslash EFTF. Thank you for your time. I will now hand over to Dr. Andrew Flight. My name is Andrew Feitz and I'm the Director for Low Carbon Geoscience and Advice at Geoscience Australia. As part of this talk, 
I will give a brief overview of offshore geological storage. GA has been supporting the development of, CS of a CCS industry in Australia for over 20 years. In the late 1990s, we worked on the first geological storage assessments and were a major contributor to the 2009 National Carbon Mapping and Infrastructure Plan, the traffic light map you see on this slide. That led to more detailed assessment work by GA in four offshore basins, including the Patrol Subbasin and Browse Basin, both of which are part of today's acreage release. Much has changed since those early studies to today. We are moving beyond whole of basin studies and instead targeting key formations and sweet spots in basins. There are also a number of commercial CCS projects at an advanced stage of development or operating around Australia. The release of the National Hydrogen Strategy in 2019 has really turbocharged renewed interest in CCS. The map on the right is an economic analysis of blue hydrogen production potential using GA's Hydrogen Economic Fairways tool. It considers links to existing infrastructure, such as gas pipelines, and proximity to advanced stage geological storage locations. Red areas show where the hydrogen production is profitable, for an example scenario. You can see that the recently announced seven prospective hydrogen hubs, the sites that are labelled in the figure, are mostly located near good geological storage reservoirs. And that's no accident. The Darwin and Pilbara hydrogen hubs are particularly relevant for today's acreage release. Before I hand over to Tom, I would like to provide a short recap on the different types of offshore geological storage currently in operation around the world. The first type is where CO2 is piped from an onshore facility to an offshore CO2 injection well. A good example is the Snowvit project in the North Sea. This project has been operating for over 10 years. All the pipelines and CO2 injection infrastructure is underwater on the seabed. The Carbonet project in Bass Strait is looking at a similar arrangement, but the offshore pipeline is relatively short, 20 kilometres, compared to the 160 kilometres for the Snowbit site. A variation on this theme is the Longship Northern Lights project, again in the North Sea, off the coast of Norway. The long-term ambition for this project is to become an international CO2 storage service provider. CO2 is transported by ship to an onshore receiving terminal and then piped offshore via an underwater pipeline for CO2 injection, approximately 100 kilometres offshore. CO2 could be sourced from ports across Europe and the UK. A second type of offshore storage is to inject from an offshore platform, like the well-known Sleipner project, again in the North Sea. This project was the first CO2 storage project for carbon abatement and has been operating for almost 25 years, storing a million tonnes of CO2 per year. CO2 is sourced from natural gas with a high CO2 content, similar to what we find in the northwest shelf of Australia. Finally, if the motivation and incentive is high, anything seems possible. This is certainly true for Petrobras's ship-based CO2 injection system in offshore Brazil. CO2 and natural gas is separated from the produced oil at sea, and the CO2 injected for further enhanced oil recovery. This is in 2,000 metres depth of water, and with CO2 injection 5,000 to 7,000 metres below the sea surface. There are currently eight of these ships operating in the Santos Basin pre-salt, and last year a total of 7 million tonnes of CO2 was stored. Truly an engineering marvel, and it does make you wonder about the potential for CO2 transport, receival and injection or by ship in the future. Well, that's it from me, and I would now like to hand over to Tom. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Tom Bernecker. I look after the acreage release projects here at Geoscience Australia. And today it's my pleasure to set the geological context of the newly released greenhouse gas storage areas. So allow me to start by Going back to uh, the basing ranking slide that Andrew showed in his previous presentation, highlighting uh, the national CCS studies that informed the government and uh, um, the stakeholders about where the optimal places are in Australia to store carbon dioxide. And what you can see from this map here is that there are several offshore provinces deemed highly suitable for um, storage. 
And not a surprise, it is uh, the Jurassic and younger sedimentary sequences that seem to have the largest potential. So in this context, um, I point you towards the Northwest Shelf, and this is where this year's aqueous release is going to occur. Two areas in uh, the Bonaparte Basin, one area in the Browse Basin, and two areas in the Carnarvon Basin. Let's start with the Petrol Subbasin. The area here is um, characterized by two large release areas. There are over 300 particular blocks. Um, area one has limited well control. Um, area two um, hosts several gas discovery wells, and these gas wells are earmarked for development in the very near future. It appears that storage in saline aquifers is the preferred um, storage option here, and the potential CO2 sources are derived from the Darwin process facilities and possibly also from future Bonaparte field developments. I'd like to highlight that Geoscience Australia undertook a major CO2 storage study uh, which assessed the, the potential for storage in the petrol subbasin. If we look at the, uh, a seismic section across the area here, we can certainly see that both release areas really span the entire basin and extend from the depot center out towards the basin flanks. What you may not really appreciate on this uh, seism section is how deep the basin actually is. It contains over 10 kilometers of sedimentary section. The target area would be the Jurassic and the Cretaceous section. So on this slide is the uh, blue and uh, the green horizons. Salt tectonism has been identified and um, existing gas production at the black tip field and are pointed out uh, f future development in uh, the petrol and turn gas fields are uh, being considered. When we look at the stratigraphy of the petrol subbasin, we can see that the oil and gas accumulations in the, the southern petrol basin uh, and include some onshore uh, discoveries, and the commercial accumulations, gas accumulations, uh, do occur in the Permian section. Further in the up section, in the Cretaceous and Jurassic section, we only have minor gas showers recorded. So if you look at the, um, the focus areas for uh, CO2 storage, we can see here that um, several areas have been identified by GA study as containing suitable and highly suitable reservoir sections. Also, highly effective seals are uh, developed in the Jurassic, but especially in the Upper Cretaceous section. GA study um, acquired um, a, a wealth of new data, including a 4,000 kilometer new uh, seismic refraction data set, and also supported by sub-bottom profiler data. You can see here on the seismic inversion that a uh, good understanding on uh, lithological uh, con continuation and lithological characteristics has been assessed and has been identified. So one of the uh, key outcomes of this one is very clearly the plover formation, the Jurassic, is the reservoir of facies as the main, represents the main objective. Geomechanical analysis also indicates that there's a low risk of fault reactivation over those targeted areas. And the modeling undertaken uh, revealed also the potentially slow migration of the injected CO2 plume. So these are important results, and you can download and access that study um, uh, utilizing the, uh, the web link at the bottom of the page. Then let's move across towards the Browse Basin, and we're looking at the Caswell Subbasin in here. The Caswell Subbasin is a producing basin since 2018, with Ichtis and Prelude coming online. Um, the discussions regarding the development of additional uh, gas resources, developing of additional gas fields, is, uh, uh, those discussions continue. And it's not a secret that the outboard gas fields like Tarosa, Brecknod, and Kellians uh, have high CO2 content. So the area here um, comprises 42 graticular blocks. Uh, the water depth ranges uh, from uh, 200 meters in the southeastern corner up to 2,000 meters in the far northwestern corner. Again, uh, it is proposed, I guess, uh, to store uh, CO2 in saline aquifers, mainly in the lower control section, and the potential CO2 will be derived from future gas field developments. Also, um, another study, a 2016 study by Geoscience Australia, assessed the, the storage potential in the Caswell subbasin. Here we look at the stratigraphy, and um, what we do uh, understand there is that the, it's the Jurassic who host the majority of the gas accumulations, while the Cretaceous, the younger section, 
uh, is the main target as for a future CO2 storage. So the GA uh, study evaluated each mappable seismic super sequence as listed here um, from K10 all the way up to T30. And the study was focused on the eastern part of the Kessel subbasin because it was um, trying to really assess the migration path pathways as uh, revealed by the decent uh, well control. We look at this section here, an example of the K30 horizon. And what the study has done, it's focused on the Cretaceous section, recognizing uh, the reduced risk of overlap between hydrocarbon exploration and CO2 storage. And it really um, identified regional scale constraints for CO2 containment, such as depth of storage limits, fault density, seal presence, and resource overlap. The regional scale assessment of CO2 storage potential is then supported by a suite of paleogeographic maps and play fairway maps, as shown here. So this example is the, um, we can put the, the area, the release area on here, and we can then look further at this K30 super sequence example. The main results indicate that the suitable reservoir facies are related to submarine fans and basin wine clinoform top sets. So suitable super sequences in the Caswell subbasin include K10, K20, K30, the lower K40 and K60 clinoform top sets. We have K10 to K40, that sequence uh, is represented by stacked basin margin plays, but also the submarine fan plays in K30, K50 and K60 are deemed suitable for CO2 storage. And it's very clear um, from the study the, has identified that the seals are best developed in the lower Cretaceous succession. Then we move over to the Northern Carnarvon Basin. The Northern Carnarvon Basin uh, is a producing region, a uh, gas producing province since 1999. Oil production uh, commenced early in the 1960s. This region here has complete 3D seismic coverage and it's characterized by extensive well control, so there's a lot of good geological and important geological information is freely available. The two um, release areas are relatively small, uh, 22 and 45 particular blocks in relatively shallow waters. Storage here um, uh, may occur in uh, depleted gas fields. Um, some of the older gas fields are nearing depletion and the potential CO2 sources are derived from industrial emissions generated in the greater Dampier region. So we look at the stratigraphy here, and uh, it's, uh, again, the majority of oil and gas accumulations are hosted by the middle to upper Jurassic section, but also include lower Cretaceous sandstone reservoirs. The target, um, as pointed out, is the uppermost uh, Jurassic here, um, represented by the Tithonian deep water fans. And what we can identify here as an example is the angel formation. And um, I like to just show a cross-section, dusted off image, but a highly instructive image, the co correlation between angel and Legendre. This really represents and highlights and demonstrates the transition from deltaic inner shelf to slope to basin floor and deposition environments. So it's the uppermost Jurassic Tithonian sandstones, the so-called angel formation, that include the reservoir facies. And it's those basin floor sandstones that are overlain and surrounded by fine-grained deep water mudstones that provide the effective seals, but also are suitable for CO2 storage, the sandstones, that is. And regionally, and this has been recognized uh, very, very widely and uh, it's known for a very long time, a very good effective regional seal is provided by the Lower Cretaceous Mudurong Shale. So with this, I'd like to summarize uh, the acreage lease, uh, saying that uh, five offshore areas are now available for assessment for greenhouse gas storage potential. As was pointed out before, that work program bids will be accepted between 4th and 10th of March 2022. And very clearly, all release areas are supported by a wealth of geological data. Let me point out what is required from a geological perspective for successful storage. First of all, and this is really important, it is injectivity. We need to understand how injectivity actually works. We need to understand the extent of favorable reservoir conditions away from the injection site. Secondly, we need to understand the capacity. What is the long-term storage potential for CO2 in the basin? 
And very importantly, also containment. You need to understand seal integrity and fault behavior. And this has been modeled in the browse, in the GA studies, in the browse and the patrol subbasin. And finally, it's also important to have monitor monitorability. You need to understand the plume behavior over time. So finally, I leave you with additional information, websites um, related to the accurate release information, greenhouse gas um, studies and projects. Um, also, uh, further access to GA's um, activities, the data discovery tool, the energy commodity resources, and importantly, um, how to access the open file offshore petroleum data on the NOPIMS website. If you want to know a little bit more hydrogen, um, you can uh, utilize these web links there. And also, if you now want to know a little bit more about exploring for the future, uh, the web link is there too. So with that, I thank you very much for listening. I hope you find this um, information useful and we look forward to interacting with you in the future. Thank you. Many thanks to the presenters from Geoscience Australia. GA has a wealth of information and data available on their website, so I would encourage any of those who have an interest to please take a look. If anybody is interested in receiving further information from GA, please do not hesitate to reach out and make contact, and I'm sure that the GA team would be more than happy to assist. Our final presenter for today's webinar is Dr. Monica Campi. Monica is the Technical Manager for Exploration at NOPTA. NOPTA is responsible for the day-to-day -day administration of petroleum and greenhouse gas titles in Commonwealth waters offshore Australia. Dr. Campi will present today on the offshore greenhouse gas regime and provide details on a number of matters that potential bidders may wish to take into account in their presentation of their application for NOPTA. Welcome. My name is Monica Campi. I'm from the National Offshore Petroleum Titles Administrator, and we also administer offshore greenhouse gas titles. To assist you with preparing your bids for the greenhouse gas acreage release, we are providing you with a quick overview of the acreage release submission process. Bids are submitted to NOPTA for assessment, and then we provide this advice to the responsible Commonwealth Minister, who is the decision maker for offshore greenhouse gas titles. As a standard disclaimer here, uh, please be aware that the information provided uh, today is a guide only and should not be considered legal advice. There's some key documents that you should be familiar with prior to bidding. We have the Act, the Guideline, the Application Form and Gazette Notice, and they all explain the requirements for preparing your bid, the timing and manner of submission of bidding and the publicly available assessment criteria used to assess the bids. Please note that the guideline has been recently updated and consolidates the three previous guidelines into one. Remember to carefully review all of the key documents when preparing your bid. And if you wonder why NOPTA does not discuss bids uh, with applicants, this is because the acreage release process is competitive and we want all companies to have the same information and make sure that everyone is treated fairly. All information that you submit is kept confidential. We have a range of new guidance material as there has been new legislation passed this year. The Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage, Titles Administration and Other Measures Bill 2021 was passed by Parliament in August this year and key features of this Act will commence on the 2nd of March 2022, a week before the acreage release closes. The new legislation introduces a new term called suitability. The term suitability is a collective term to refer to the matters that are considered by decision makers to assess whether applicants are capable, competent and responsible in managing offshore projects as relevant to the specific decision. These matters include the technical advice, financial resources available to the applicant, compliance history, relevant experience and corporate governance and other matters as relevant. Bids submitted in this round will be assessed under this new suitability criteria and will be discussed later in this presentation. There are several publications that have been referenced here and are expected to be published within the next month on our website. There's a fact sheet for the declarations of experience and disclosures, the guideline of applicant suitability, and the not to forms guidance. To be validly made, the application must be accompanied by a range of things. It must be accompanied by a correctly completed and executed application form, including any information or documents required by the application form in accordance with subsection 2963 and section 426 of the OPGGS Act, and be submitted within the timeframe specified in the relevant Australian Government Gazette notice. You'll notice here that a new feature for this acreage release is a bidding window. 
which opens on Friday the 4th of March 2022 and closes at 4pm local time on the 10th of March 2022. We cannot accept applications made outside this bidding window. Once the application is submitted, the composition and timing of the proposed work program may not be amended through the submission of further information and other changes will not be accepted. Other factors to take into account when submitting a bid are other relevant matters such as environmental protection, defence, navigation, native title interests, fisheries, the impact of overlap with petroleum titles, especially if you're planning operational activities, and any access restrictions. Applicants are expected to have obtained and submitted any other regulatory approvals necessary, if relevant, to allow for the potential offer of an assessment permit. This includes approval by the Foreign Investment Review Board or FERB. If advised of a pending FERB approval, where possible the RCM will delay making a decision on the application or offer the award of a permit until the FERB decision has been finalised. So please keep us informed if you're having to go through the FERB process. Prior to commencing assessment, NOPDA may request clarification of information provided in your bid. This does delay the process, so it's best to be as clear as possible when submitting your bid to avoid this. There's a couple of common themes that we've noticed over the years in doing acreage release, so please take note. We often need to seek clarification around the work program, so please be clear about each commitment and its indicative cost. For seismic data, please make sure you provide the amount within the release area of either new data that you may acquire or data that you will reprocess and whether that new data is being acquired or licensed from a third party vendor. And the workflow or type of reprocessing or processing that it will be conducted. Also, please provide the details of the technical studies that you might conduct, such as any geological, geophysical migration modeling or geomechanics or any other studies. You can describe contingent work and how it relates to your assessment strategy, but this cannot be considered when assessing the guaranteed work program. Similarly, if you're conducting regional work, please be clear what will be conducted within the release area. The reasons we ask these questions is if you are the successful bidder, the work program activities become your legal commitment and cannot be reduced. Also, regulatory approvals such as environment plans will not be considered as separate work program commitments as we see them as an integral part of the operational activity. The second area is for financial resources. Each applicant must provide the details of the financial resources that are or will be available to the applicants. The details must include one of the following, a copy of or a link to the applicant's current annual reports, including financial statements, or a copy of the most recent financial statements for each applicant. Where financial information has been provided to the titles administrator recently and there has been no material change, the information does not need to be provided again, but this must be stated in the application and a reference to the relevant documentation should be provided. If providing a related entity's annual report or financial statements, a description of the relationship between the applicant and the related entity is also required to be provided. Similarly, if you're relying on the technical support of a related entity, please make this relationship clear. And finally, please make sure that your application form and bid documents match and all your numbers add up. It's surprising how often this doesn't happen. The responsible Commonwealth Minister awards greenhouse gas assessment permits to the applicant that best proposes the work strategy and work program that will significantly advance the understanding of the fundamental suitability determinants of potential greenhouse gas storage formations and potential greenhouse gas injection sites. The fundamental suitability determinants are the amount of greenhouse gas substance that is suitable to store in that site the particular greenhouse gas substance or substances that are suitable to store, the proposed injection point or points and proposed injection period, any proposed engineering enhancements and the effective sealing feature or attribute mechanism or geotechnical characteristics of the site that make it suitable for permanent storage. The applicant also needs to demonstrate the potential greenhouse gas storage formations or potential greenhouse gas storage sites within the permit area and this is through the technical evaluation of available data prior to bidding and development of an appropriate strategy and work program and an applicant that has a satisfactory record of past performance. 
the responsible Commonwealth Minister in accordance with subsection 2963 of the OPGGS Act must also consider the technical advice and financial resources available to the applicant to deliver the proposed work program and the matters outlined in section 695YB of the OPGGS Act, which relate to the applicant's suitability to hold a title. So this is the new legislation that was described earlier. This will require a section 695YB declaration to be submitted per applicant. If the declaration is not submitted with the application, NOPDA will follow this up with a request for further information. So we've only been able to highlight a few areas today in order to try and help you with your bid submission. So please make sure you read the key documents as these provide all the information you need. And if you have any further questions around the submission process, please contact our titles team. So thank you for your time and we hope to see some submissions in the new year. Thank you, Monica. Government is very much cognizant of lead times for project delivery for CCS projects. And as a result, is keen to work with industry to assist where possible. With this in mind, I would just like to reiterate the timeframes for bidding and also the importance of reviewing the new guidelines which are available on NOPTA's website in respect to the submission of applications. Should you have any questions regarding the process, please do not hesitate to reach out to the relevant areas. On the screen, you'll see a number of different websites listed. So the first URL is where you will find all the key information and maps for the 2021 greenhouse gas release. As mentioned earlier, GA has also published a wealth of material regarding carbon caption and storage on their website, which can be found at the second URL listed. Finally, NOPTA's website contains all the required forms and guidance which may be required for potential bidders. NOPTA's NEETS website is an interactive map and is an excellent visualisation tool and is one which I would definitely recommend a visit to. NEETS provides access to publicly available information regarding offshore titles and other applications. And so finally, I would just like to thank all the presenters once again for their time today. And that brings a close to that formal part of the webinar. We now turn to today's Q&A session. The panel today comprises of the presenters that we heard from earlier, including Ms. Christina Anastasi, Dr. Tom Bernicke, and Dr. Andrew Fites from Geoscience Australia. Dr. Campy will be representing NOPTA, and I myself will be representing the department.